Okay, well, it looks like we're ready for the next session. I'm sorry, you must be very tired of my voice, but I, I'm chairing this one, so I'll just be quick. And it's an absolute pleasure um, to introduce Scott Mandelbrot, who's um, the Pern librarian and, and, and a fellow of Peterhouse College, also in Cambridge. Scott has done quite remarkable service to, to, to Newton's scholarship. He's worked on Newton as a patristic scholar, as a biblical scholar, uh, among many other things. I remember when I was in the first year of my PhD, I read the piece on Newton's uh, correspondence with Burnett, with Thomas Burnett that Scott wrote, and I went into my supervision with my supervisor and I said, this is the kind of history that I want to do. So I think there's no better model of someone who works on that than Scott. And indeed, Scott's services to Newton scholarship go well beyond that. Not only is he editing a vast collection on the reception of Newton, but I think is scheduled to come out quite soon, but he is also one of the co-organizers of the Newton project. And I think I speak for almost all, well, I'm sure all of us here when I say that this has been an utterly invaluable resource to all of our work on Newton, and, and, and we are deeply grateful for the remarkable editorial work that Scott's done. So let me now introduce Scott Mandelbrot, and he's speaking on Newton's general scholium in 17th and 18th century religion. Scott. Um, well, thank you very much, Dimitri. Um, don't read what he told you about. It's full of mistakes. Um, and um, I haven't got any pictures or anything else, so you can go to sleep quietly now for the next half an hour or so. Um, Steve set me this topic to do. It's not perhaps one I would have chosen for myself. Um, indeed, I tried quite hard to get out of it and to do some of the other ones, but I wasn't allowed. Why was I afraid of this topic? I think I was afraid of it because it contains potentially everything. How have I tried to cope with that problem? I've tried to cope with it by deciding that actually the answer is not very much. So um, I'm afraid you're going to get another kind of iconoclastic effort, although one that will be much less polished than the one that you've just listened to. Why do I think that, um, given the undoubted importance of Newton for 18th century natural theology, and indeed natural theology afterwards? Well, I think perhaps it's worth following on a little bit from um, the story that Dimitri has just told you. There, in answering questions, Dimitri explained that uh, there was a strong tradition in 17th century English universities of thinking of, natural the of metaphysics as being natural theology. This is a tradition which changes. That language of speaking about natural theology changes, and it changes in Newton's lifetime or in the lifetime of Newton's immediate successors. And one of the ways it changes is by taking on board the comment that Newton makes at the end of the general trolium that we've already discussed several times about the fact that what he's doing when he's talking about God in this way is in some way natural philosophy. And the great achievement of Newton the natural theologian, as presented by those people who want uh, to or who are themselves engaged in altering the nature of metaphysics and natural theology in late 17th and early 18th century England, is an argument about the lawfulness of the universe and an argument about what <coughs> will be learnt about God from such a lawful universe. This is an argument, in fact, which is at least as much Richard Bench's argument as it is Isaac Newton's argument. And it's an argument which many people take up and attribute to Newton later on. This is a very important element of the natural theological reception of Newton's work, and it's an element which can easily be 
harmonized with other, work, other things that Newtonians are doing in the 18th century and with their approach to experimental natural philosophy. So take that as read. I'm not saying that Newton is unimportant for 18th central natural theology. I'm not saying that Newton's natural philosophy is unimportant for that. I just want to ask the question of the extent to which it is the general Scholium which places or raises the questions that matter for Newton's reputation as a natural theologian. And I want to ask that question mainly because it seems to me that the majority of readers of the general Scholium either fundamentally misunderstood, or more likely deliberately misunderstood, what <coughs> Newton was saying, and consequently presented Newton fairly consistently across a wide variety of locations in both time and space as being precisely what Newton set out not to be. And they did that on the basis of what they claimed to find in the general Scholium, although in fact I don't think it was the general Scholium, which is a further aspect of my argument for distancing the reception of the general Scholium, I don't think it was ultimately the general Scholium that made them think of Newton in those terms. I think it was things that Newton wrote, things that we think are closely related to the general Scholium, things which they also thought were closely related to the general Scholium, but things which had already made their mind up about what Newton was thinking about metaphysical questions. Okay, well that's what I'm going to argue. And misunderstanding seems to me to be an essential part of the reception of the general Scholium from its beginning. The most amusing misunderstanding, of course, being that of Newton's old friend, Nicolas Facio de Duillier, who on receipt of his copy of the second edition of the Principia worked out quite cleverly that there had been a cancel leaf in, or a cancellation made to the text of the general Scholium, and also worked out of, in typical style that this, of course, meant that Newton had uh, really intended to endorse his own theories of a mechanical causation of gravity. That sort of misunderstanding is actually much more widespread than you might think. And I'm afraid I think the reason for it, the text that explains the errors in people's approach to the general Scholium, um, is in fact the Latin edition of the optics. It's what Newton says in what becomes Query 31, in particular what Newton says about the sensorium of God, that determines the way that people will read the general Scholium and explains why people will in fact not bother to read the general Scholium, but will read into that text what they've already decided Newton is. And of course what they've already decided Newton is, is as I've already said, the opposite of what Newton actually is. It is that he is a Spinozist, it is that he is a materialist, it is that he is somebody uh, who is presenting um, a view of nature, which others have already said he is presenting, John Toland in his letters to Serena, which we've already had discussed, and other writers, but which we know, and Newton's friends knew, he wasn't presenting. Other people, as I say, I think just choose not to get involved in this debate. Now this reception, this view of the sort of mistaken reception of the general Scholium, which I'll take you through in a little bit more detail in a moment, is one which can be complicated and has been complicated by some historians, perhaps including me, um, by thinking about the general Scholium in the context of a number of debates which are going on at the time of its publication or a number of events which are going on at the time of its publication. And of course, the one which really casts the longest shadow in that sense is the quarrel between Newton and Leibniz, whose real origins have 
really nothing to do with this, although questions of natural theology have been, and of reactions to natural theological writing, have been part of that argument, uh, perhaps for almost the 20 years that it has been running. But it didn't start because of those questions. But there are other contexts which help to determine or, or influence in some way the reception of the General Scholium. The other most obvious one is the publication of Samuel Clarke's Scripture Doctrine of the Trinity in the year before. Whether or not we think Newton and Clarke agree doesn't matter. What matters is that quite a lot of contemporaries decided that Newton and Clarke agreed, and therefore, to all intents and purposes, they did. Another context less uh, perhaps immediately relevant, though it might come up if one looks at the scriptural citations and does some of the other things that we've been doing with the general scholium, is the context of something which didn't happen, but which people discovered relatively shortly afterwards was going to happen or might have happened, namely the publication of Newton's letters on the two notable corruptions of scripture, which had been being prepared for publication in 1709 and which Newton pulled from the press for whatever reason. And there certainly are later readers for whom knowledge of the fact that Newton was an Arian and the history of this episode uh, became public in England about 25 years later, so in the end of the 1730s, beginning of the 1740s, though the texts were not published for another decade and a bit. Um, awareness that Newton was, in some sense, was certainly an anti-Trinitarian, probably an Arian, may have coloured some receptions of the general scholium, um, though uh, we'll see that it, it does so in very specific terms. Similarly, enthusias enthusiasm for Newton's supposed Arianism colours other receptions, most notably those uh, of Clark himself and, as we've heard, of William Whiston, though there are problems there. You didn't need to wait until the, the end of the 1730s to know that the General Scholium, or to infer that the General Scholium might be a heterodox text, if you wanted to do that. I'm not making any statement about whether it is, I'm just saying what people might think about it. Um, because John Edwards, as we've already seen in 1714, uh, happily told his readers that Newton's ideas here dero 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 derived in some way from the ideas of um, Crelius, uh, from the ideas, in other words, of a well-known Unitarian writer, a member, or, and uh, indeed someone who Newton not only read, uh, but... Uh, also uh, met. So those are some of the contexts for thinking about the reception of this text and some of the problems involved in it. I'm going to start by thinking, however, um, about the first serious and substantial <coughs> translation of the text. By then, by... Um, the date that this text is published, there have already been some other translations and some other work making known Newton's um, ideas and indeed comments suggesting that the general scholium constituted the creed of Isaac Newton even. But the text I want to think about, which is remarkable in a number of ways to begin with, is John Maxwell's A Discourse Concerning God. published in 1715, where Maxwell says that he translates parts of the, well, he translates the general scholium in order that um, readers who are curious about Newton's views who don't know Latin can understand it, and he claims to have friends who fall into that category. And he takes us through um, also a discussion of the absolute nature of God, um, a discussion of uh, the relationship of uh, Newton and Clark. Maxwell is an instrument maker, an engraver, who certainly is also a friend of Clark's or knows what Clark is doing. Um, he discusses 
uh, Clark's attacks on Toland, so he knows the context in which uh, to place the general Scholium well. Uh, he also very clearly sets up Newton as an opponent of Descartes, who he calls as effectual, though not as barefaced a promoter of atheism as ever was in the world. Very interestingly, he alights on one of the verses, uh, one of the proof texts that we've already looked at, that um, Newton uh, uses uh, in order to describe the relationship between God and creation, that is Acts 17, 27 to 28. In him all things are contained and move. And in doing so, he sets up something which will become a bit of a theme. That's the verse that people like of the verses that Newton cites, and there's a very good reason why it's that verse. That's one of them, apart from anything else, that's one of the verses which can be made least controversial and which represents a most, can be shaped most easily to fit pretty much any vision of Newton's metaphysics. He talks about dominion, he talks about God's power over creatures, he discusses this in an interesting anthropological context, he holds that this is the view not only of Christians but also of Jews and Mahometans, in fact his view is that Islam presents an absolute slavery of the creature to God. Um, he also extends that discussion to a consideration of whether the Hottentots have a metaphysics, which is quite amusing. And he goes through other texts. Very interestingly, from our point of view, he takes us through Newton's discussion of the Arabic meaning of the word, Arabic der the derivation of the word deus from the Arabic, according to uh, Pocock. And he does so in words which absolutely echo the words of the Principia. Now, Newton had already made that argument. We've seen he made it in, dra in one of the drafts of the General Scholium, but he didn't publish it in 1713 in the second edition of the Principia. It only came into print in 1726 in the third edition of the Principia. So it seems to me that Maxwell not only was close to Clark, not only translated Newton, but also knew what Newton was thinking behind his published texts, which makes this a very interesting document and one that is possibly worthy of rather more attention than historians have so far given it. Um, but in general, the early reception of the Principia outside of the circle of Newton's friends is most influenced, of course, by the work of Leibniz, of Bernoulli, and of their friends. It's a continental reception, which is the most important reception. And it's that reception which also draws in Clark. And this is the reception that seems to me to be dominated by the back history of Newton's ideas about God as explained uh, by Clark in his translation of the queries uh, to, of the additional queries to the optics. And of course, it's also dominated by a desire to get back at Newton. For example, Christian Wolff, writing to Leibniz, uh, comments, no, I think he's writing to Bernoulli, actually, but anyway, Christian Wolff comments that he can't believe that anyone who is capable of what he describes as the raillery of the general Scholium could have invented the calculus. The general Scholium is so mad that its inventor it, its author could not have discovered the calculus for himself. And it's in the correspondence of Leibniz and Bernoulli and their circle in the very first years following the publication of the General Scholium, and to some extent then in the correspondence that Clark publishes and that is rapidly translated into both English and French and circulated by Des Maisons, particularly in French and from 1720, um, that some of the problems that we all know about in the reception of and, and understanding of the general Scholium are built up. But it's also there that the implication is given, which dominates the further debate, that Newton is a Spinozist, that Newton is someone 
who reads matter as having, uh, in some sense, come alive, who sees God as being indistinguishable from his creation. How you think this, I don't understand, because it's absolutely clearly not what it says in the General Sholian, but it does become easier to understand if you bear in mind that these people have all been considering for some time just what the hell the, sen the idea of space as God's sensorium might be. So very early on, within a year or two of the publication of the General Sholian, some of the main problems have been established. There are people who are concerned about things like uh, Newton's discussion of God, but not apparent mention of Christ as Lord. There are people who are concerned about this question of uh, God as a soul of the world or as a material cause. There are also a number of other issues which have already come up, which are very interesting in the later history of um, understandings of the general Sholian, including interesting for modern scholars and their understandings of the general Sholian. One of these is discussion about the precise meaning of the term Pantocrator, interest in the question of whether or not the Church Fathers, for example, um, Maxwell happily talks about Lactantius in this context, uh, had an understanding of the Pantocrator which uh, was quite different from Newton's in particular because they used the term with reference to Christ, not to God. So that's one. Another issue is this concentration already apparent in the reception on Acts 17, 27 to 8 as the proof text that most embodies the idea of what Newton is saying about the natural world in uh, the General Sholian, that Newton is somehow just the same as St. Paul uh, in this quotation from Acts. A third, which is interesting, particularly because it panders to the concerns that will very soon be expressed by a particular sect of English critics of Newton, the Hutchinsonians, is the idea raised by Maxwell, present in Newton's earlier writings, that somehow um, Newton's idea of God derives from Arabic, from Islamic sources. A fourth is the idea which still inhabits the literature, and is repeated several times in the 18th century and arises, I think, first with Leibniz, that Newton is in some sense indebted, in some important structural sense, indebted to Henry Moore for the arguments that he makes in the General Trolium. There may be similarities of language, but I, which is what Leibniz has spotted, but I don't think that Newton is structurally indebted to Henry Moore. But 18th century critics did, and many 20th century critics have, therefore, also done so. Perhaps the most successful text that presents Newton the natural philosopher in the 18th century, um, or one of them anyway, um, was Alexander Pope's essay on man. The most interesting commentary on Pope, written by a critic of Newton's theology and a critic of Newton's chronology, um, William Warburton, made explicit how Pope had understood Newton's text. Uh, yeah, I have to find my text. Warburton said that Pope's essay on man provided a commentary on Newton's understanding of Acts 17, 27 to 8 that God is, uh, in, in God we live and move and have our being. And this is, was based on um, the claim in Pope's writing that all are but parts of one stupendous whole whose body nature is and God the soul, which was then footnoted by Warburton to a text in the General Trolium. Warburton went on, this sublime description of the Godhead contains not only the divinity of St. Paul, but if that will not satisfy, the philosophy likewise <coughs> of Sir Isaac Newton. So here again we have um, evidence of uh, an early theme that comes to be very important in the broader dissemination of the attitudes of, to Newton as natural philosopher, but which is only very tangentially connected with the arguments of the general Trolian. Much more interested in those arguments, in the structure of the general Trolian, um, was uh, Newton's defender, uh, 
Voltaire, in particular in his 1740 publication on the metaphysics of Isaac Newton. Voltaire takes us through various metaphysical arguments that Newton might have made. They are, include arguments drawn from the general scholium, they also include arguments drawn from the optics willy-nilly. But most important in my concerns of this story of misunderstanding is Voltaire's conclusion. Because according to Voltaire, what Newton has achieved in the general scholium is a renewal of Gassondism. Newton is the new Gassondi. That is what the general scholium is. That is also why it is an effective response to atheism, philosophical atheism, be it the atheism of Descartes or the later atheism of Spinoza and, by implication, followers of Descartes like Leibniz. Not because Newton has had a new idea about God, but because Newton has revived or engaged in the Christianization of atomist natural philosophy. Now, we can see how Voltaire gets there. We can perhaps think of crude reasons why Voltaire might want to get there, but it seems to me extremely interesting that that is where he gets, because the general view of Newton's success as a natural theolo theologian in the 18th century is not that he propagated Gassondism, but that is what his leading defender says. Very quickly, Voltaire was criticised by um, German theologians and metaphysicians, including writers from the University of Göttingen, for whom um, Newton's ideas of omnipresence uh, represent a problem. Such criticisms, again linking him to Spinozism, can be traced also in the writings of Immanuel Kant, and here um, Eric's work has been very interesting. But these are just examples of what I've already set out as, I think, being one of the main themes of the reception of the General Scholium. Coming back to England a little bit later than, uh, um, a little, well, contemporary with Voltaire's visit to England in the early 1730s, the people who were interested in Newton's Arabism uh, were the Hutchinsonians, in particular John Hutchinson in his treatise on power. Um, where he, in fact, notices this problem, which he holds up um, the problem of Newton's reference to Pocock. Um, and this is particularly serious for Hutchinson because he believes that Arabic scholarship has completely distorted uh, contemporaries' understandings of the Hebrew Bible, that the truth about the Hebrew Bible is uh, hidden to everyone except for him and, indeed, hidden to most anyone before him as well, um, and that the Hebrew Bible must be read in a completely different way, and that in that way it reveals the truth about nature, and that truth about nature is the exact opposite of Isaac Newton's Principia, it is Moses' Principia, which does away with what Hutchinson sees as the essential materialism, again, of Newton's God. So there are a number of people reading the general scholium in these slightly strange ways uh, before the middle of the 18th century. Then it seems to me things do change. One of the ways in which they change, uh, and attitudes to Newton's natural theology, it seems to me, become more established around the ideas of lawfulness with which we began. Orthodox theologians have no trouble saying it doesn't matter that Newton was uh, an Arian if he was, it doesn't matter if he has some funny ideas about uh, God, but his ideas about the lawful nature of the universe and what that tells us about God, these matter. And those orthodox theologians include the Archbishop of Canterbury, Archbishop Secker. What brings about this change? Seems to me very simple. From 1756, people can read Newton's correspondence with Bentley. Before that, they couldn't. So that our under their understanding of the Principia, of the general scholium, after 1756, is informed by all those texts in the letters between Newton and Bentley, which we've used to inform our understanding of this text. And that helps to push the dominance of the metaphysics of the optics in the discussion of the general scholium a little bit, uh, to push back against that a little bit. Nevertheless, late 18th century critics of Newton over a wide spectrum share some of the doubts that we've uh, been raising. And it's really quite striking how critical of Newton a lot of people who we might expect <coughs> to take him seriously are. They include, for example, a whole raft of heroes 
of the English Enlightenment. Uh, I would mean the Scottish Enlightenment. Sorry, I must get, mustn't make these sorts of mistakes. Um, <laughs> though, um, uh, and indeed the American Enlightenment. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's, let's push. Um, Richard Price, for example, who thinks that Newton is writing simply nonsense in the general Sholium, um, because he doesn't understand uh, how a deity that exists always and everywhere um, can be any different from a deity that exists nowhere and not at all. Um, and he really just doesn't follow this argument. Um, it also includes Lord Kames, Henry Home, uh, who thinks that Newton has, uh, who simply rejects the arguments of Voltaire, Maupertuis, and uh, Newton as relating to the cause of gravity and finds the, uh, what he thinks, what matters with regard to, is to find a cause for gravity. And he therefore rejects the natural theology also of the general Sholium. Similarly, at the very end of the century, James Burnett, Lord Monbodo, um, convicts Newton of a tendency to materialism, sees God as the immediate cause of motion in the general Sholium, and argues that this is exactly like Spinoza. And by then, of course, he has friends in the radical enlightenment. Um, those friends, most important of them, uh, the Baron Dolbach translator into French of the works of John Toland, well aware of what Toland had said about Newton, um, and convinced similarly that uh, Newton's uh, general Sholium uh, represented an aberration in his otherwise considerable, considerably high opinion of Newton's natural philosophy. And an aberration precisely because of the political, moral, and social consequences of Newton's definition of God. The God of Newton is a despot, that is to say, a man. And he has the privileges of being good when it pleases him, unjust and perverse when his fancy so determines him. This is an extreme version of Newton, the Islamic philosopher, uh, an extreme version of the argument which has been presented earlier in the century. So the immortal Newton, to use another term of Dolbach, is not only the discoverer of the laws of nature, the laws that will enable us to establish a true view of God and of the workings of matter. He is also someone whose false view of God threatens our liberty and our place in the world. This seems to me not to be the standard history of the reception of the general Sholium. It may, of course, be an entirely false one. My method of working in trying to determine this has been to look specifically at texts which say they're discussing the general Sholium, rather than texts which just discuss Newton's natural theology or Newton's idea of God. But I think it's very interesting that in these texts we've seen so many of the themes which also animate modern scholarship. <coughs> themes which may not always be obvious or even present in the general Sholium, but themes that were certainly present in the ways in which 18th century readers tried to understand that text. Thanks. Thank you very much, Scott. It's immensely rich as ever. Straight away, I'll ask for questions and shepherd people to the microphone. So I'll start there and then I'll go around. <laughs> well, Scott, uh, first of all, I found that completely fascinating. Um, but I'm not. I knew that was Bob. But the, well, there, <laughs> well, I could sit down now. Um, but <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure that in it, your argument at the beginning, uh, as I understood it, was there were the all this this misunderstandings that follow not necessarily from the reading of the general scholium. And I certainly don't have any problem with your argument, which I think 
has, there's not sufficient attention been paid to query 31. I, th I think you're quite right about that, and that could do with a lot more work. And yet, what I did here the rest of the time was a great long list of people who interpreted Newton in part, surely, from reading the general scovium. So I'm not sure that the examples you give sustain the proposition you began with, unless I completely misunderstood it. I could give you a very long list to add to your own, but. The, the reason why I believe they do sustain my argument is that it seems to me that in the accounts of the people I described, even Voltaire, the general scholium is playing second fiddle to the optics in terms of the presentation of Newton's ideas. It's not that people don't read the text. It's that they, they, they read it having already decided that they know what Newton thinks about <coughs> metaphysics or whatever it, we want to call this thing. Um, and it's that fact which affects how they then read it. Now, there may well be people who I haven't found for whom that's not true, in which case I would be <laughs> in trouble. But the people I referred to, even as I say Voltaire, it is true. Could I just respond to that then? Because uh, if you begin with Edwards, I think what happened, I think you're right about maybe not reading the scholium, but they're reading Edwards and others. And there's a great piling on, right? And you get all the way through Hicks and so on, uh, toward the end of the 18th century. It, it's all back referencing. It's not necessarily the reading of either Scolium or Query 31, but it's rather reading the theological and indeed religious discourse of the first half of the century. And I think that is where the problem lies for me. What is it that they're reading? And it may not be Newton, but it may be certain very negative reactions to the general scholium. Sure. I mean, it, it, this is why I said it was shaped by the correspondence between Leibniz and Bernoulli and their friends. This, at that stage, was not a published correspondence. It, some of it becomes, some of it becomes a published correspondence. Right. And already right. then it's... Right. Yeah, no, no, sure, there, there, there are as well. Um, and again, well, I started with contemporary British readers. Um, I think that, that it is shaped quite early, and I would wholly agree with you that we need to look at uh, the broader context of that reception in order to determine where it goes. Yeah? Uh, thanks for a wonderful talk. Um, there's one thing that I've always liked to try imagining, which is what the other appendix that Newton mentions to Coates when he first imagines writing the gener general scholium would have looked like. And in some ways from the, I mean, he only very briefly describes this and this, uh, uh, it actually would seem to perhaps be much more closely linked to the optics if that was the, the project that he'd undertaken. So uh, I, I just mentioned that as, a, as an issue that Newton at uh, least considered adding something that would have perhaps had a closer link. That doesn't mean that the other uh, discussions aren't misreadings, but I think there's also a broader issue, which is just whether anybody was actually reading the Principia, uh, let alone the General Scolium, as opposed to the optics. And so I think well, there's and as opposed to Coates's preface, which right? As opposed to Coates's preface, fits with the more easily and um, assimilated version of Newton's natural theology that I was positing at the beginning. Right. So I, I think part of the story of the misreadings is as you were emphasizing just in response to the last question, that, that there were other people reading the optics, and I think the uptake of that w is a quite different story than the Principia, where the one of the odd things, and this is something that uh, Niccolo has emphasized so strongly, is that the, the, the mathematical framework of the Principia was so um, unusual for the contemporaries that the people who would have uh, you know, been most actively working, first of all, two of them died, David Gregory and Roger Coates, but then other people who would have followed that tradition started using the Leibnizian calculus instead. So the Principia was 
had an odd uh, impact on its own tradition. Nevertheless, I mean, many of the people I referred to definitely did read the Principia and were indeed um, <laughs> some of the Principia's closest and most able readers. Mm -hmm. um, and in a way, what's of, I mean, one of the things that's surprising is some of the people who also turn out to have been, and notably Maxwell, but also in his own way Hutchinson, who turn out to be such good readers of the Principia, so alert to little things. Mike's a follow-up to your very last comments, uh, which I could not have anticipated when I formulated my question. Um, thank you for your paper. Um, I want to understand a bit the dialectic between the Hutchinsonians and Newton. Um, because, and bring in the scolium to the definitions, um, as uh, Andrew, among others, has rightly emphasized. It's one of the, in the uh, uh, Steve mentioned uh, earlier today, it's one of the few places where Newton brings in uh, the Bible, it seems, into the Principia itself. Uh, where he explains on his view what uh, may have, uh, what the mosaic philosophy ought to have been if properly understood by him, uh, as by him. Now, um, Hutchinson saw the connection between the general scholium and the scholium to the definitions. As you, I think, rightly point out, he had a different view on uh, what the proper uh, mosaic philosophy was. Um, but it looks to me like um, <coughs> the scolium to the definitions is a kind of, is being echoed in the general scolium in the way that Hutchinson discerns and then rejects to. And it strikes me that on your reading, that ought also classify, seems to have been classified as a misreading. Whereas uh, I would want to distinguish between the first order debate between what the proper physics of the Bible is, and indeed Hutchinson's physics is much closer to Descartes than I think Hutchinson himself ought to have you know, made clear. And I think Hume at some moment has a lot of fun with this. I some manuscript evidence on it. Um, but I think the general claim, namely that the general scolium is a kind of commentary on this very cryptic material in the scolium to the definitions, that strikes me as a very s subtle and right reading of what Newton might well have been up to in the general scolium. So there's a kind of now Cambridge deflationism that I'm sensing, <laughs> but, uh, but I, um, I, I would think Hutchison is right about this. So let me defend that, even though the first order view he is wrong about. OK. Um, I'm, I'm perfectly happy with that. Um, I'm also perfectly happy with Hutchinsonian misreading, um, although Larry would be delighted and probably <laughs> knows Hutchinsonian <laughs> misreading because um, Robert Spearman in 1757 uh, states quite clearly that the general scholium was added by Newton to the Principia to support Clark's scripture doctrine of the Trinity, an argument I think you'd be sympathetic, <laughs> broadly sympathetic with too. So, um, you know, that's also there. I don't know whether you got it from Spearman, but I mean, he, he yeah. that's a Hutchinsonian misreading, I think. But there are more acute comments. I mean, Hutchinson himself, I think, I don't think he's understood the Principia in a lot of the time, but I think he has read the Principia quite carefully. I was curious about what you were saying in the extent to which the quote from Act 17 uh, features in the readings of the General Scolium. And I was wondering if you could comment on the role or the influence of Newton in general interpretations of that verse, sort of from that point onwards. If you know at all, or are, like, are sermons, now that people preach, say, on, uh, on this passage, does this 
do they now reach to Newton and actually say, well, as our great you know, Isaac Newton says, this is how we should interpret it. Is, is there kind of a, a place in which Newton actually is inserting himself into the traditions and the commentaries on that section of scripture? Well, of course, Newton, as we've seen, presents that yes. in equivalence with a good half dozen other verses. What struck me, I, I, haven't, I should have looked at sermon literature on Acts, and I didn't. Um, one of the reasons I didn't was actually that it seemed to me that what people were saying was so commonplace. Mm. But it seems to, what struck me was that of those verses, this is the one that people decide matters. Yes. And it's the one that they decide matters, it seems to me, um, because it's the one which, whilst in some way echoing the sound of the language of the general folium, removes the controversy of the discussion of God mm. from the general folium and puts it very neatly back in a very orthodox box. Yes. Whereas the other references, as we've seen in our discussion, are actually a bit more problematic because some of them, in fact, may be awkward on the doctrine of the Trinity or may be awkward on the nature precisely of God's power or may say something about the relationship between God and creatures, which isn't quite orthodox. Mm. At least, you know, they might, or somebody might have used them that way. But yeah. this one seems safe, <laughs> and it seems to me very instructive, therefore, that it is this one that people choose. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Scott has, in his uh, typically <coughs> modest way, has quietly covered a century over three countries, or was it four countries, and 20 or 25 texts. So I think we can only thank him for that immensely rich paper, which, which I'm sure we'll continue to talk about over tea and over